As we head into 2021, I think it's safe to say we're all hoping to put the year that was firmly behind us, but we can't really ignore the fact that there are a lot of question marks hovering around us. The global economy, China, vaccines, changes to government stimulus, and whether or not APRA will step in to slow a galloping property market. So I think the big thing for 2021 is that the owner occupiers are leading the way. I think the investors are going to come to the party next year big time. And that's not just because the market's building momentum and it seems attractive to investors. It's not just because investors have been sort of soft for three years now, but it's because investors have got nowhere to put their money. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as down Download our free full or forecast report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. To help us get a better understanding of the big things that could make or break us this year, we're joined by economist Warren Hogan. Warren was formerly the chief economist for ANZ Bank and currently wears a number of hats including that of industry professor at UTS Business School and chief economic advisor at the Executive Connection. Now, we last spoke to Warren in mid-2019, episode 75, if you want to go back and have a listen. And at that time, there was plenty of talk circulating around us heading into a, dis- uh, sorry, a recession. Now, I think it's fair to say that none of us anticipated that a pandemic would send us there. Thank you for joining us today, Warren. We're looking forward to your insights. Thanks, Veronica. It's great to be back and uh, in a very different world to last time we spoke. Yes. That's right, Warren. I mean, what a year to be an economist, I guess, just watching things and learning, I guess. But before we talk about Australia, what do you think the global sort of legacy 2020 is going to have on sort of the global economy? Yeah, I think we'll we'll put it down as a, as a, a change in the direction of world history. These things obviously accumulate, um, but mm. this was a, a tipping point, at least in terms of recognising it. And that big change is obviously the end of what might be called the sort of the neoliberal era of globalisation and financialization and the, the rise of the people who didn't benefit from that. And uh, that's best sort of summed up by Trump. Um, but a whole range of other things such as, you know, the rise of China and geopolitical discord and of course what this pandemic really showed apart from all the health issues which are really important of course but is that when it comes down to it we're all a bunch of nations um Mm. and although we have worked very hard to coordinate and everything in the end everyone's first sort of preference or priority is to look after their own country um and I think that's the challenge that the world represents right now is that the the model that we've had for the last 40 years which is Australia has benefited from greatly um, is changing. It has been changing since the GFC, and I fear that change is going to get is the pace is going to pick up a lot more as we go into the twenty twenties. So when you say it's changing, you're sort of talking about really a reversal of globalisation. Well, I think that's uh, certainly a banner issue, uh, a headline sort of issue. I think uh, there's a lot more to it than just trade or the movement of goods and services and people uh, capital and yeah well look the pandemic (laughs) stopped the movement of people which is critical i think i think that'll revive maybe not to the extent it was but it's actually a recognition that whatever happens in an economy um there are winners and losers Mm. and the smart societies help the losers and make sure that what's going on is sustainable and America certainly didn't get that right. They've got a whole sort of industrial working class that's either been displaced or has seen their standard of living stop. We've got that to some extent here. Um, But it is. It's people who don't like the system that's brought a lot of wealth and economic benefit to only a proportion of the society. And, of course, there's all the things that go along with that sort of ultra sort of profit motive type driven corporate world and things around the environment. And, and, and there's a lot of stuff, you know, so yes, globalization is the headline, but it's a lot of 
mm. I think what people would regard as unsustainable behaviours that are, are an offshoot of that 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 era. Greed. Give it a name. Yep. Greed over <laughs> uh, greed over concern, I suppose, uh, mm. could be could be part of it. But yeah, look, there's there's a world that's changing too. The rise of China is obviously the the again the headline. Um, yeah. But it's really about the fact that the the European model, the post World War Two model, is is not the only model. So, do you envisage that China is probably going to be one of the biggest beneficiaries of this sort of change? I mean, seen today that they don't want our coal anymore, um, which is probably, you know, that canary in the coal mine saying is kind of, you know, hard to sort of put together. You know, do you think that China is going to literally be demanding the way the world's going to go from here? Well, I think they're, they're going to have a big say in it, or they, they're at least going to do what they feel they've got to do, uh, and that has got a lot to do with the rest of the world because uh, they're resource dependent. That is, they have to import a lot of stuff, whether it's our, well, not coal anymore, um, but iron ore mm-hmm. and, and food. Um, you know, they, they need to trade um, or, or have an empire like the Europeans used to have. Uh, they need resources, so they're going to very much want to shape the world, and they are. And the behaviours to Australia right now in 2020 um, are all geopolitical. They are all about China exerting its oh. um, dominant position in Asia, exerting its global muscle, and 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 we're we're really the ones copying it. And and what will be interesting here is how much the rest of the world comes to our defence. I saw mm. when they put the tariffs on our wine. Wine lovers all around the world got together and, and sort of had a, had a drink <laughs> for Australia, um, but right now the, the 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 issue is actually whether the 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 free world, for a lack of a better term, uh, actually really stands up to China on what they're doing to Australia. Because if we appease the mm-hmm. Chinese, well, we saw what that happened in the nineteen thirties with the Germans. Well, it, it you know, call me simplistic, call me naive, but why are we still selling so much iron ore to them then? Uh, well, they're, they're the world's biggest producer of steel. They make about half the world's steel. That's a position they've um, attained in the last 20, 25 years. Um, and they, they don't have a lot of iron ore within their borders. They have to import mm. that key ingredient to steel. You'll note that the coal bands on Australia are only for thermal coal, I believe, not for coking coal, which is obviously the other component to steel. Mm. Um mm. So they, they are the world's biggest producer of steel. Their exports of steel are more than the second biggest producer's total output, which is Japan. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then South Korea is another massive producer of steel. So Northeast Asia is the world's steel-making hub. Um, Australia and Brazil are the big suppliers of iron ore, and so they need us. Um, the so why can't we use it as a, yeah, yeah, as a exactly. bargaining chip? That's right, we can. And, and look, the Australian government's – sort of caught between trying to manage the situation and also be a good sort of global citizen in terms of trade behaviours. Mm. But one thing I've sort of suggested is an export tariff on iron ore where <laughs> you actually, you know, charge the Chinese more. Um, but that that will be us, you know, you know, turning the turning the dial up on the conflict. So, so yeah, you know, um, I don't think I don't think there's any um, should be any illusions that we're we're in a cold war. Um, and uh, the, that's it's where it right in the middle of it right now in Australia. Well, I think through the GFC or post GFC, the coal pr- and the iron ore price, you know, was one of the saviors for the Australian economy, and you know mm. we've kind of hit nine year highs again now. Do you think that we can just sort of piggyback off iron ore to get us through, even if other parts of the economy don't, you know, get sold to China, for example? Well, look, I think it's it's just a wonderful feature of the Australian economy, um, our natural resource base. We're sort of, you know, 25 million people with this massive land mass um, mm. that has a lot of resources from, from things like steel and other minerals and metals to precious metals and food. Um, so we should always be, you know, sustainably taking advantage of that and we've done it in various ways, you know, back in the, you know, it was wool and wheat at times now it's metal metal. um but it does highlight what's going on now that you know we we are vulnerable to this international economy and to particular trading partners um you know we need to diversify um and we will one way or the other whether it's painfully or not um (laughs) if this situation with china deteriorates but i think there is a broader issue is it's great to take advantage of that resource base and the money that comes with it, but it, we shouldn't let it 
stop the rest of the economy um, being match fit. Um, mm. And I think that's the big issue here is getting our manufacturing sector up and going again. It has shrunk over the last 40 years from 14% of the economy to 6 um, And the government is identifying that as critical and they've identified key areas. Our services economy, I mean, unfortunately, some of the most important um, sectors for Australia have been hit hard by the pandemic in terms of tourism and ed- international education. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we, we do not want to be just, you know, totally reliant on these resources. And, and, and that's, I think, something that um, we're going we're gonna to continue to have to look at very closely and we will be forced to. So you see a future for manufacturing in Australia? No, oh, totally. Um, it, we have to get the right policy settings. Um you know, the big challenge, you know, the way the pressure brought to bear on our manufacturing sector is all essentially about um, our currency being uh, higher than it otherwise would because of our mineral exports, because of iron ore exports, because of coal exports. The Aussie dollar is mm. higher. Mm. That makes it harder for our manufacturers to compete either with imports or in terms of exports into international markets. I've done a lot of work with the food and beverage manufacturing industry in the last 18 months, and this is our biggest manufacturing sector by far. Mm. And we have a natural marketplace, you know, feeding Australians. We have a great natural resource input, i.e. agriculture. I mean, Australia produces about three times as much food each year as we need. Uh, but we are losing capacity in that space. Uh, we have been losing what we call non-food groceries, so, you know, all the you know hand sanitizers and toilet paper, um, all of that stuff has gradually gone overseas because it's easy, it's cheaper to make over there, and we're starting to see longer life foods shift overseas as well. And so this is an area that's got to be addressed. We've got you know it's great history in this space, and the government is now actively looking at ways to support investment in that industry. So I think yeah we do we do in the um, we've got the the know how. You, you look at some of our successful manufacturing in the last 20 years and it's actually high-end stuff so there's a there's companies in victoria that produce the machines that produce the manufacturing equipment to make apple iphones for example you know the australian company makes the machine that makes the machine so to speak yeah (laughs) so we're very high end it's just about getting the economics right and and the australian government doesn't you know provide a huge amount of support to industry like it used to generations ago um and, uh, of course, a lot of Asian countries are very heavily government influenced, obviously China being the ultimate expression of that with all its state-owned enterprises and so forth. Yeah. You haven't mentioned so, yeah, wages, though. yeah, we've got a big challenge. Sorry. Because, wa- I mean, you haven't mentioned wages because obviously our cost of labour is, mm. is a lot higher than a lot of those countries as well. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, it, it'll it'll preclude certain low-end manufacturing. And, and you're seeing the Chinese actually shed a lot of textile and cheap manufacturing into Southeast Asia in the last 10 years because mm. their wages are going up. Mm. So, yeah, it is about what kind of manufacturing. So I, I remember visiting when I was at ANZ, you know, Mercedes in Germany and and sort of, you know, because ANZ was very Asian-focused and I was giving them all the wage costs for different parts of Southeast Asia and trying to tell them why they should set up their next, you know, C-class manufacturing facility in Vietnam or something. <laughs> and they actually said, well, look, it actually doesn't matter to us anymore because, you know, basically – we automate everything and, you know, we have high-end mm. manufacturing workers and we want to make our stuff in Germany as much as possible. And and that's the mentality. It's the interesting thing, and you'll find this with our unions, is, you know, in our car industry was a classic example of, you know, you lose jobs in manufacturing through automation. Mm. But the, the data shows that the countries with the most manufacturing employment with the highest levels of pay are those with the highest levels of automation, that being Germany and South Korea. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, we've got a future. We've just got to be smart about it. And we are coming from behind the eight ball because, you know, we, we, we have, I wouldn't say let that industry whittle on the vine, but, you know, it, it, it hasn't had a critical mass in many different sectors. So, I mean, the exchange rate is the issue there plus wages, but, I mean, obviously the exchange rate, the government's trying to reduce it, but every country in the world is trying to do the same <laughs> thing. So you've got this kind yeah. of yeah. currency war that's been playing out for a long time. Um mm but if not amplified through the last year. I mean, what's your views around this quantitative easing and, you know, are we going to keep on doing it? I mean, is there enough? You know, I guess there's a, you know, Bill Evans, I guess, thinks another $100 billion in 2021. I mean, do you think something similar to that? So what's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the, I, I just read that in the paper myself and, you know, that seems reasonable. Um, they've done $100 billion 
for the first six months of the program, which will take us through to basically budget time next year, then uh, I'd say that program will be extended. Yes, that the, the, the QE in Australia, which I, I didn't think they were going to do and I don't think they should be doing it right now, mm. um, is us officially joining that currency war. But the problem we've got is, you know, that $100 billion is just nothing compared yeah. to what the Japanese, <laughs> yeah. the Europeans <laughs> yeah. and the Americans produce. So... I actually don't think it's material, um, but it's yeah. uh, it's a it's an insurance policy against not just the currency going up, but you know long term funding costs going up, and you know that does affect the ability for our financial system to provide cheap credit to the domestic market, which of course is um, yeah you know important right now, um, and obviously a major factor driving the housing market. Well, that's it, isn't it? You know, we might not win the the exchange rate war, but we will definitely. Uh, push down the cost of long-term credit, which, you know, you can already see that's forcing going to sort of mortgage rates and mm. encouraging people to pump up house prices, I guess. Yeah, uh, and I think that's the big story right now is is the housing market in Australia. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a, a, it's a phenomenal story and I think 2021 is going to be a, a big year for property in Australia. <laughs> and when, I mean, we feel that on the ground, but what are you looking at when you say that? Mm. Yeah, so I thought that you know, and you guys would know this better than anyone. We had a we had a cyclical downturn in property in 2016-17 that stretched into 2019. Yeah, you know, we mm-hmm. had that huge bull market. Then we had the APRA standards that were tightened. Rates didn't go up, but they didn't come down. Um, and so we had a slowdown, and that was probably a health. It was a healthy thing. Um, I was mm-hmm. a bit surprised how long it went for. I thought we'd turn around in 19. I was probably quite bullish when we spoke in mid 19. Um, but by earlier did, this year, it did, yeah, and it was yeah, late yeah. in the year it really started to turn. Yeah, and uh, we went into the pandemic with a, a bit of momentum in, uh, you know, a, a, you know, sentiment um, and an activity was picking up in the housing market. The pandemic obviously is just like a pause button, uh, <laughs> and then the RBA obviously has cut rates even further and various other sort of things are going on in the industries so in terms of startups and non-bank lenders and a lot of there's a lot of funding out there uh, the deferrals have been critical to just you know the whole economy but it's also sort of taken sort of that risk of a wholesale fire sale in the investor space so what you're seeing is you're seeing something quite unusual for Australia in the context of you know the last 20 years anyway and that's owner occupiers driving this upswing yeah. Um, and I think that's the pent up demand in that sector from the downturn, which started in, you know, 17 and really should have been really picking up speed when the pandemic hit, but didn't. So there's some pent up demand from a few years of soft market conditions. And then there's a preference shift uh, uh, off the pandemic. I'm, I'm strongly of the view that people are going, actually, I want to live in the suburbs. I don't want to live in an apartment or I'm happy to oh, yeah. actually buy a place three hours out of Sydney now, not just two hours where it's really expensive or what have you. Um, so we're, we're seeing this surge in activity by own occupiers, both first home buyers and upgraders, and yet the investor market's still been lagging. And mm. the new mortgage data shows investors have been really soft really now for three years. So my view is that we're going to, you know, assuming we continue on the path of recovery from the pandemic, there's huge amounts of government stimulus in the system. It looks like we should transition through the end of JobKeeper pretty well, although we've got to keep an eye on that. And then the end of the bank deferrals doesn't look like it's going to be the hiccup that we thought it might have been, given that so many of those deferrals have sort of brought, been brought back online. Yeah. So I think the big thing for 2021 is that the owner occupiers are leading the way. I think the investors are going to come to the party next year big time. And that's not just because the market's building momentum and it seems attractive to investors. It's not just because investors have been sort of soft for three years now, but it's because investors have got nowhere to put their money. you got term mm, deposits yeah. at 50 <laughs> yes. basis points and they're going to work out after getting, you know, three quarterly statements where their 200 grand deposit has paid them precisely, you know, what? Two grand, one thousand dollars, thousand dollars, yeah, uh, a year, and then they yeah. think, oh, house prices just went up fifteen percent in Jeringong. Mm. Um, so I reckon the investors are going to hit the hit the market hard next year and put that sort of 
typical marginal that yeah the investor is usually the one driving the market in, in Sydney in Australia um, in the last thirty years and I think they're going to get back in there and I think house prices are going to really take off and this is this is all in the sort of the broader consistent with the broader story that uh, when central banks ease monetary policy which uh, you know was cutting rates in the old days yep. which is now cutting rates to zero and doing quantitative easing is that the old fear of inflation, which is measured as the price of milk and butter, um, is not there. And where all the inflation is, is in asset prices. All that extra liquidity they're mm. forcing into mm. the system gets blown out into the economy, into the society through housing markets, through equity markets, you know, maybe through the price of things like gold and collector's items and fine art. Yep. So it's asset price inflation, and I think that we saw something unique with this pandemic, not just in this country but around the world, which was both a massive fiscal stimulus and further monetary stimulus. It's proven to work, but as soon as it works, it's almost by definition too much and the thing's going to just explode. So the explosion in this country, more than just anyone in the world, is going to be house prices. You know, mm. and, and and some commercial property as well. Although I haven't got as much sort of visibility on that or strong view on that, but all asset prices are going to go up, and, and in this country, it's, it's residential property that leads the way. And that's sort of interesting because if asset prices are going up, then it's still not pumping more money into the economy, is it? Like it's. Oh not- no, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it does a lot of things. So yeah, there's obviously all sorts of bad stuff like inter- intergenerational wealth transfers and yep. putting massive mortgages on young people, which basically is a form of enslavement. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, no, there's a, and it's been going on for a while, don't worry. We've all been joined that party, um, yep. modern, <laughs> modern slavery. Um, <laughs> so it's probably overstating and being disrespectful for people who actually have experienced that stuff. But anyway. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah I we'll have miss. heard employee, employers say, you know, I want I want my workforce all with big mortgages so they have to come to work. That's right. <laughs> and that's why there's no wage. You know, people aren't asking for wage increases because they value Ooh. the security of the income more than an extra 1% or 2% in a pay rise because they've got to pay that mortgage. Or even that innovation. All, that all, right? You don't, you know, you don't go and start that startup when you've got that big mortgage. Mm. Destroys so, entrepreneurialism. I know three people younger than me, but good friends, who um, have uh, one of them has taken the leap, and two of them just couldn't do it. So, and the one who took the leap has got an outstandingly um, optimistic and uh, you know risk loving um, disposition. You need that. Um, you need it now. You just the ability of taking risk. You know, when your wife, in his case, the wife, in fact, all of them were the wives who have kids, young kids, saying, mm. yeah, yep. the wives are working. Um, it's just that they needed the two incomes to live where they wanted to. So, so anyway, look, I think, um, you know, we're going to see, um, you know, that asset price inflation dynamic, that, that sort of, uh, easy money, um, it does get into the economy through perceptions of wealth, through the fact that someone actually does get the cash when you borrow the money and you know, yeah. they may put it into something else. I mean, immediately that might end up in Mercedes and Lamborghinis and boats rather than uh, it does speak to a broader problem we got around inequality and underlying demand in the economy. We won't go into that now, but it does yeah. get in there. It's just a, I think it's a very clunky way to do it. Uh, the big one, though, is construction. And mm. that's the area where we still got a few sort of question marks because the pandemic, of course, has shut the borders. The population dynamics in the short term are going to shift. Mm. And that may have some implications for construction, particularly in the apartment sector, which has been been pretty, you know, much half the market for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, in terms of construction. But that's actually the real kick to the economy. When the housing market picks up, prices pick up, people get involved, then they start going and building and doing renovations and that gives people jobs and gets the whole thing fired up. And um, I think that will happen, but I think price is going to move a lot more early, i.e. 2021 before the construction piece and the jobs piece goes later. We're already seeing a renovation boom though. 
you know, like may not, may, maybe not in the multi-dwelling space, but actual individuals renovating their properties, you know, I mean, on a, on a micro level, I was talking to my builder because I renovated and finished at the beginning of this year and, and they said they've got contracts signed up for the next 12 months and they've, you know, they've had a good pipelines before, but they've never actually had the contracts signed up, you know, yeah. for 12 months worth of build. And, um, you know, and across the board, you just see hoarding on so many properties. Um, it, it's noticeable the increase in renovation. Uh, yeah. I'm only talking Sydney, of course, but um, well, it's happening everywhere because it's, a, mm. it's a, it is that dynamic. There's the, the typical dynamic, which is the capitalization story. I because the land value has gone up, we can now, you know, yeah, mm. yes, the, which is just a cyclical, it. yeah. Um, mm. Well, afford to you can get justify access, but also renovating justify, it. Justify, yeah, yeah. Yes. No one's actually ever told me what the right ratio is, how much the house is worth to the land. But anyway, there's apparently some 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 number. <laughs> we all oh, want. there's all sorts of theories. <laughs> yeah, on I'm that. sure there is. Yeah. Anyway, all we know is when prices go up, people put in new kitchens. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, I think again, a behavioural shift is everyone's been stuck at home. All these people yeah. are normally slaving yeah. away in the office for sixty hours a week, sitting at work at home, going, "Okay, I've really got to do something about this place." Yeah. Um, I'm sure that's part of it, and that's why I reckon if you want to do a renovation, which I would like to do a, a new kitchen, but I'm waiting at least eighteen months. You know, it's just going to be a nightmare trying to get that work done in Sydney in the next eighteen months. Yeah, we well, only live once, Warren. <laughs> yeah, the kitchen will survive. I did a kitchen about four years ago in my previous place, so I think I can just wait on this one for a little while. <laughs> it might take eighty months to get built. You know, that's right. It- it's, and it'd be just um, like the last one we were without a kitchen for four weeks and I thought I was going to, you know, move out. So, <laughs> I mean, you can see that High Rise Harry is very um, in the media. He loves it anyway. But, I mean, he's we've got to, you know, we need stimulus. We need subsidies. Um, we need to get rid of the foreign, you know, tax, additional stamp duty. Um, yeah. Now, ultimately, you haven't got university students. You haven't got migration, which generally do buy new apartments. Um no investors. A lot of first home buyers have been made aware of, hopefully through podcasts like this, that <laughs> the building issues and the risks of buying off the plan and new property and the performance mm. of those. So, you know, you can see the construction sector is really going to struggle to get that confidence back, which, um, you know, a lot of the building issues are, are part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually haven't heard many really dire anecdotes um, apart oh, from. We've you got know, plenty for you. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. <laughs> If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. I mean, this one today is uh, it's on the Australian, and this is, uh, I mean, public knowledge, you know, lend lease uh, subsidising. This is not, nothing to do with lend lease in particular, but, um, you know, there's a housing development package that's in Jordan Springs East in Western Sydney, and it's been uh, built on a dump, basically, mm. uh, and the whole suburb sinking. Well, and, no, no. you know, 600 million lend lease are going to have to fund all the buyers in that new house and land package development to sort of offset their house sinking, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty well, it's terrible a, one. What a nightmare. Yeah, that is, that, that is a nightmare. But um, <laughs> I think, well, I think actually, that – just- on that, just because, you know, we all know that the Opal Towers story and the Mascot Towers story, but this is the first one really about a suburb, you know. Yeah. So we talk about, oh, that's one building. This is our suburb. So it's just an interesting and a terrible um, example, I guess, of how bad it can go. I, I'd like to think that if, you know, High Rise Harry and others like him, instead of just trying to get the government to say, yeah, 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 let more foreigners, you know, buy our stock because then they just build it to a different standard. They don't build it to a local standard. I like to see the whole bloody standards rise and the demand from buyers push those developers to actually build better product and then then we can have more confidence in encouraging people to buy them. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, (laughs) I I would would agree with that. that And I think it also is this cheap money phenomenon where, you know, where money's, you know, not only cheap or interest rates are low but, readily available, um, you get sort of, you drag in a lot of second tier, lower standard players mm. uh, into the development game. Uh, 
And yeah, the standards I think are, are, are really important. So I would agree. I mean, this this is going to be one of the big sort of battlegrounds and decision points for our society. Um, is do we want to run a high immigration program or not? And you know, if we do, and I don't see any you know, major reasons. I think it's there's more risk to stopping it than not. But then, you know, what, what does that mean? And things like you've just talked about around building standards. Um, I think there's a lot of issues around standards full stop that our community needs to be clearer on. Um, mm. If we're going to run sort of a, a, a somewhat chaotic society, which I think Australia's just managed brilliantly and it's created a great <laughs> place, yeah. but, you know, we still need standards. You can't have the standards in anything, whether it's building codes or certain behaviours coming in from other countries with these you know, newly arrived Australians, so... Anyway, that's a different story, but I think it's part, think of, what it's part of what the way people are going to be thinking an issue people are going to be thinking about as we deglobalize and nationalism rises. Well, that's going to be, you know, in 12 months' time, let's say we haven't gone there, but the vaccine or, you know, we, <laughs> that's a conversation itself. But let's say they do open the borders in 2022, 2023. What's your thoughts on what's the alternative for the government? Do they go back to importing people? You know, we all know the economic benefits of that. Um, or do they take a more conservative approach or do they even increase the number that they were thinking to play catch up, but also um, just because it's such a sugar hit for the economy? Yeah, so the, the budget actually has the government's assumptions around these things um, under underpinning it because you have to have some view on population in order to create mm. sort of that, you know, forecasts for the economy and therefore for the budget. And essentially the way they've, they've sort of um, structured it in terms of the uh, going forward, is that you, got, you obviously got the borders closed till the middle of 2022, in which case um, you have a massive decline in permanent visas and temporary visas. So actually, the population growth goes to sort of near zero for 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 sort of a year, and then it comes back. But when you come back, you you come back to essentially a. Um, uh, a population dynamic the same as what we had before. So essentially it's no catch-up, which are my numbers telling me that means we're going to lose about 400,000 Australians from what we would have been otherwise, which in the long scheme mm-hmm. of things isn't that much, but it is significant in the next few years. <clears throat> then the other one is is that they're not factoring in any curtailment of the immigration program. So that's going to, that's, that's a, yeah, I think a sensible way the government's gone about it. Just we're going back to normal, what we regarded as normal the last 10 years. But that will be the political issue. Um, and that'll be an issue that I think will be a difficult one. Australia's managed it pretty well. It doesn't explicitly just debate immigration policy. I mean, this government cut immigration back a little bit in a headline manner with announcements, but in reality, they hardly did anything. So (laughs) they're fighting a battle between listening to the sort of anti-immigration, nationalistic, you know, this sort of these forces that are sort of getting louder and bigger that I talked about earlier around the world versus an economic reality that without immigration, Australia's growth rate would be a lot lower and our whole economy would be a lot more problematic with all the debt that we've got out there in the household sector. Well, Gladys well, was out there quite publicly, wasn't she? We need to slow down, you know, cut in immigration. Um, even though she was on a building sort of boom, um, COVID's allowed her to ease congestion, but I hear that it's kind of back to where it was. No, People don't want to use the public transport. But that's well, right. she just got to say we have to use masks on public transport. And I think a lot more people would actually use public transport, but that's a whole other issue. The the vaccine, though, I mean, all of this, all this conversation about, you know, population um, mm. growth returning to, you know, normal levels in inverted commas um, really relies on vaccine, right? And the type of vaccine that uh, will, uh, you know, prevent the spread of the virus. And I was just listening to Dr. Norman Swan this morning. It's quite fascinating in terms of what this vaccine that's, that Pfizer's just released is meant to do. It's, he said it's, you know, it's really, you still get it, but you don't get symptoms. I think that's basically the way it was. So it, it's like there's different, there's vaccines and there's vaccines, right? Um, and and then it's got to get rolled out and then it's got to be proven to see does it actually create immunity amongst in the in the population or not there's just so much that we don't know about these vaccines mm. this is just like the first line of defense right um you know can immigration return without that uh well no i don't think we're going to be opening our borders in any meaningful way to anyone uh 
while uh, the virus is still circulating. I mean, we're still so early in the piece with this virus and we don't even know what immunity is like once you get it. Yeah. Mm. At the moment they're saying it's kind of funny in the last few months, you go, oh, we think immunity lasts for eight months. It's like, why is that? So, well, because people have had immunity who got it eight months ago when it first came up. Okay. <laughs> that's, yeah. well, that's very scientific. So they don't know that. Um, it looks good for the vaccines. I'm no expert in that stuff. Um, yeah. But we, 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 the one thing about this virus, which just is obvious in the UK announcement overnight about this new strain there, mm. is it's just, it's just so virile. It's just so yeah. contagious. Um, and it mutates. And, yeah. And we know that we've already painted it as the absolute bogeyman, that it's the world's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's a major threat. And you can see that in our domestic politics at the state level and border closures. So, it's going to be very hard to convince people in this country or elsewhere that, you know, we're going to have to live with the virus. So Australia and New Zealand have locked themselves into an elimination strategy effectively. Mm. Um, where, you know, if we, if, you know, if we, we're not going to be opening our borders in any meaningful way mm. until the thing's not around. Because if it gets in at all, it just, it's we've just got no immunity in our community. It'll just take off like it is in South Korea right now, who did so well, mm. Germany, who did well. Yeah. yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just so virile. So, yeah, look, it's, Europe, it's a long way to go. They are actually living with it. You know, I, my sister lives in Italy and I was talking to her the other day and, of course, they had these, you know, terrible, well, it's still terrible. They've got 600 deaths a day and, I mean, it's still pretty horrible. Um, but, you know, obviously at the beginning they went to a very hard lockdown and, and they led the, the, other than China, of course, they sort of led the world because they were the first ones really to get, to get um, infected with it. And... You know, I said, well, what's happened after after summer? Because, of course, they all went on holidays all throughout Europe and then, of course, they've had a second wave and, and it's worse than the first wave. And, and I'm like, what are you doing? Are you going back into lockdown? She goes, oh, no, you know, there's there's three stages. We've got yellow, orange and red. And if you're in red, you know, you can't move around as, as frequently. They'll, they'll close the restaurants and cafes, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're in orange, you know, they're opening it for takeaway and, and they're restricting <laughs> travel from one region to another. But largely even though COVID is very much in the community, they are living with it, you know, yeah. and uh, and they've all just accepted. I think they can't afford not to. And so it's a, that economic versus health decision, really. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is yeah, the it is. payoff. And, and we have been lucky. We've managed to sort of get on top of it. Um, and, you know, Australia and New Zealand did better than other countries in the Spanish flu 100 years ago because of our natural isolation. Mm. And also don't underestimate the fact that we, we don't live in as congested a lifestyle as the European True. and Asian and North American countries. So there is more space. I think that explains why people want to live in houses again in Australia yes. after sort of 20 <laughs> years of moving into apartments. Um, so, you know, we just don't have that mentality and what what I see is the risk. And I don't, I, I, I don't think this is going to happen and I hope it doesn't, but the risk for Australia and New Zealand is that we're going to have to live with this thing forever. You know, that there is no mm. effective sort of elimination strategy. It's like any other mm. flu that pops up. But because it's so virile, um, when it pops up, it, it, you know, it hits you like a ton of bricks as a community. Mm. And if that's the case, which, you know, we all pray that it's not the case, but if that's the case, Australian New Zealand strategy is the wrong one. So you kind of mentioned there, we're not doing a bit of a segue back into the property market. I think you, uh, you know, people want to live in houses, but I think another thing is obviously driving that is interest rates, which we spoke about before. I mean, I noticed this week that it's the first time that RBA treasury rates sort of went under zero. Um, mm. You know, that's, it's a very interesting thing, you know, to get your head around. And, um, you know, a lot of Europe's had it for a long time and, but, you know, what, what's, what's not really happening there? And is are we going to see negative rates here? I mean, what's your view on all that? Yeah, so because we're part of an international financial system with a free flow of capital, we, we get we just, you know, we get sucked into the vortex of what's happening overseas. And the thing about the international, the world economy is that while capital flows around freely, almost completely uninhibited, with the exception of a few places like China, um, <laughs> uh, trading goods and services moves around but not quite as freely. You can't sell a Big Mac made in Sydney and Tokyo if it's a mispricing. Um, but there is a lot of trading goods and services still. But the one thing 
there's huge restrictions on, which we were just talking about, is is people. Um, and the big thing is is that there are countries like Japan right now, and has been the case for a while, that have shrinking populations. Like literally, mm-hmm. their population is declining. Yeah. Their working age population has been declining now for 15 years. Um, in parts of Europe, it's sort of not far behind Japan. So you could argue that when, you know, when you, you wake up at the start of each year and sort of go, okay, well, our economy is going to be, or our population is going to be 1% smaller at the end of the year, then having a 1% smaller economy is, you know, everyone's still got the same standard of living, theoretically. Um mm. And therefore, you could also argue, because the interest rate level sort of broadly just should match up to the rate of growth in the economy, that maybe negative interest rates isn't a a bad thing. Um, Problem is, is places like Australia, our our underlying growth, but you know, maybe not right this second, but you know, over the last ten years, is 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 quite strong. We got immigration, we got a you know a younger population than than Japan or Europe. And our interest rates should not be negative. But because capital's flying around everywhere, it's dragging our interest rates down and pushing our currency up. And so, yeah, the international economy is not perfectly integrated, but the money system isn't far from it, and that's what's causing it. So, yeah, our our interest rates shouldn't be negative in any way, shape, or form. Things like negative rates or other unconventional monetary policies like QE or term funding facilities for banks. They're, they're sort of things that in a place like Australia you put in place when there's a crisis, like a mm. once-in-a-hundred-year pandemic. But you get rid <laughs> of them straight away because our interest yeah, rates is. in this country, the base rate, which is currently 0.1%, over the next 10 years, if we're going to get growth of 1% or 2% with inflation of 1% or 2%, that means our interest rate should be 3 or 4%. And anything below that is easy, stimulatory, and it will create distortions in the economy. So the RBA is a price taker, for lack of a better word, in the world economy. They just have to respond to all these money flying around the world. They've tried to resist, but they can't. And, of course, what that means is that we're going to have bigger asset price bubbles than everyone else because we've got more growth. We've got a better, brighter future than places like Japan. But their money is all flowing in. The bank margin, obviously, the big four have always controlled the market and, um, you know, it's been good times for shareholders of the big four. Um, But, you know, bit by bit they're slowly – not doing anything they're kind of stuck in time and a lot of new entrants are sort of stealing their market share so that margin is getting smaller every year so Mm. not only is the rba rate low but you know the people the cost that people borrow at due to competition is is getting sharper and sharper Um, and so you know obviously this leads into what you said you know earlier about a property market boom um which you know veronica and i kind of can see as well but do you think there's going to be the APRA, you know, who knows what could happen. The payment holidays taught me a lesson and said no one knows what's going to happen around the corner. But what do you think they're going to do to sort of slow things down? I'm, I'm not sure is the, is the, is, is the, is the answer. Um, they, they, I'm pretty sure if the market plays out as I'm thinking, um, they will do something. The, the, the RBA through the Council of Financial Regulators, which is essentially, you know, APRA and the RBA and the Treasury all sitting around and ASIC and ACCC and everyone talking about what the world is around them. And the the RBA will say to APRA, we need some help. We don't want to have to put rates up, but there is some financial instability concerns. People are just borrowing too much, which is essentially what happened in 2016. You've got to remember in the old days, like like pre-96 and 97, APRA used to be part of the RBA. It was part of the central bank's function to monitor the banking system, which I would strongly argue is uh, what it should be, but that was a mistake what we did. But anyway, so the RBA will ask APRA (laughs) to do something. What they did before was essentially look at investors. There's no need to do that right now because investors are not not, doing anything crazy. Mm. So then the next thing they do is LVRs and um, that hits first home buyers yeah um i don't know it's going to be interesting to see i i to, to be fair i haven't put a lot of thought into it other than to say they're going to have to do something <laughs> which um <laughs> uh you know those are the two main things that they've done in the past but because this cycle is different as i sort of spoke about earlier that it's been driven by owner occupiers whereas past cycles have really at the margin been driven by investors they, they may have to come up with a different sort of approach and, and I'm not sure exactly what that is. It, it, they've only got so many tools, which is, you know, LVRs, 
um, and, and sort of uh, pricing. Mm. Yeah, they've eased all of this stuff, right? They panicked when this pandemic exactly. struck. They just eased everything up to go back and yeah. shifted sort of they might be a bit reticent to because it'll look like, you know, they're chopping and changing. But, you know, in the end, they do what they've got to do. Uh, but what it means is they'll be late. So it won't be in February or March. It'll be in, you know, June, July. It'll be once the, ha- once the investors are, you know, clearly pushing prices up 10 15% across the whole country that, that, that they'll respond, they'll respond late. They should be doing something right now, basically. What's interesting is, though, in the absence of investors, it's showing true demand, though, isn't it? Because, of course, back in 2016 with investors mm-hmm. you know, really high in, in percentage in, in activity in the marketplace, it's hard to separate out of that, well, what is the real demand for housing, you know, for actual properties or, or accommodation, if you like. Um, yep. And, I, you know, I, it's funny because at the beginning of COVID, I thought to myself, I think I even might have said it a couple of times on this podcast, but, you know, I, People being cooped up in their houses, the minute they're let out, they're going to get bolt out like greyhounds chasing rabbits. They're going to be like, give me a bigger house. And that's exactly what we've seen. Um, you know, we've seen search terms, you know, for home owners mm. of 800% and stuff like that. So this is this is a real reaction, I think, that's quite measurable, you know, um, for people think, in the actual living. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's real. And uh, you've got the issue about what it does at the residential end. Which is mm. you know home office. And then you got the the I think potentially even bigger issue is about what it means for commercial property because I think there's no doubt that a lot of people who work in CBDs in office blocks um, are going to at least spend twenty percent of their time at home now. When, yeah, more, yeah, more than before. So yeah, Fridays are done deal. Um, but will they spend? <laughs> will will they spend? two days or three days at home. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason you're looking at three, four hours out of Sydney or Melbourne or Adelaide for a, for a uh, country property is because, you know, if you're going away for a two-day weekend, you'd sort of go away, you could drive for two hours. Mm. Yeah, you exactly. wouldn't drive for four. But if you're going away for a four-day weekend and you're working while you're away, you'll drive yeah. for three or four. So suddenly yeah. Bateman's Bay is in play. So... I think that you, you're you really going to see this big shift away from office towards home, away from the city towards the suburbs and the regions, and this is all technology enabled with the background of health concerns. And um, I don't know where it lands. None of us do, but I think it's a, that's the one of the big issues for 21 is is what decisions are made by businesses and, and how people respond. Do people leave jobs because, you know, they're being told they have to go back to the office and they can't actually work from home two days a week? Yeah, I don't know. But that's the big well, one for it, me. Isn't it? It, it works. It's a negotiation, ends. yeah, between yeah. employers and employees. And the power has always been with employers. But now, employees are saying, "Well, this is what we want," uh, especially the top talent. And they say, "Well, if you're not going to offer me flexible working, let's say they want three days at home, and employers want three days at work, which is much different to five days at work." You know, last year. We just don't know how that negotiation is going to play out. I guess. Uh, no, it's just financially. It you got to think, you know, an employer's position, you think, well, I need less office space. You know, well, there's, there's a, a real benefit to them. Yeah. Oh, if you're look, it's, it's very real. And I think they're very, you know, a lot of businesses right now, the senior management are very keen to sort of get some visibility on what that looks like so they can start mm. making decisions because, they, you know, you're paying a lot of rent in places and you're seeing huge discounting going on across the CBDs of uh, all around the world to keep keep businesses in office space and so forth. This will take a couple of years, if not three to five, to play out. But there's mm. got to be a, a structural shift down in demand. Now, does it just mean that a whole bunch of B and C grade commercial property in the cities gets turned into retail or even residential? Yeah. I don't know the answer. That was sort of what was happening before. But yeah. do people want to live in the city now, given that, you know, health concerns? We just don't know where it's going to settle. So... Yeah, I, th- I think it's it's that's one of the key un- unknowns for the for the whole industry. But we do know one thing is that the the people's views on where they live have shifted, no matter what happens around the office. And that is, we're going to spend more time at home. We want a bigger home, and we probably want some people are going to consider that they can have a serious professional job in the city and live three hours out of Sydney. 
Well, some people are moving moving states and doing that. You know, the, we've had a number of uh, interviews around Brisbane and uh, anecdotally we're hearing from buyers agents up there that people with big jobs who normally would be bound to live in Melbourne or Sydney are now actually relocating, living in Brisbane and still having their big job, you know, yeah, and working and, remotely. And, you know, I mean, I think, Chris, you mentioned about, you know, if you're, if you're one of the superstars and you can negotiate it, well, you know, mm. if the senior management team all live in Byron Bay, yeah, they got to, They can't then make all their mid, middle managers and ex, other executives all turn up to the office every day. You know, <laughs> it's, that culture will not work unless you work for you know Harry Triggerboff or Frank Lowry. You know, <laughs> um, I, I did really love like Byron Bay. I do feel for them right now because they've just lost their beach. Um, I was up there a couple of months ago. I was like, "Where's this beach gone?" And then you know, this big storm happening at the mm. moment. Just, well, they shouldn't have built on the sand dunes. <laughs> yeah. It's a biblical <laughs> principle on that, you know. There's a few things I remember from my my Sunday school days, you know, those who build well, houses from, on sand. <laughs> I learned it from first year geography is that, you know, you need sand dunes to replenish beaches. But anyway, local councils in Australia 50, 60, 70 years ago never did that geography lesson. No. <laughs> and they but, still haven't worked it out in many cases. Well, they've cases. worked it out, but they can't fix it. <laughs> oh, I know. So is that There's, your property done by Warren? Or yeah. Have you got it, is, on source? it is. There we go. It certainly is. It's it's the residents in, in Terrigal and Wenamble who want the council to bail them out in Collaroy, um, probably some in Byron Bay maybe. I don't think there is actually a lot of beachfront properties in Byron Bay, but you build on a sand dune, you're going to lose your house because the sand dunes are there to replenish the beach when you have a king tide or a major storm, and that's not just in Sydney or the east coast of Australia. That's natural all around the world. And I don't think the rest of us should be bailing people out who've paid a fortune for beachfront property. I think in a, a world we're moving into where this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue over the next 50 years, um, you buy a, you build a, buy a house on a sand dune, then you're a dumbo. <laughs> Yeah, I'm inclined to agree, and I'm like, you know, it'd be different if all these people had invited everyone over in the in the community that couldn't afford the beachfront home, and to actually give them, you know, direct access to the beach in front of their houses before these. It'd be different if they were community minded in that way. But yes, I'm pretty certain yeah. a lot of them haven't. I'm not going to comment on that, Veronica. But uh, you know, there is yin and yang. There is karma. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on out there, and their houses are washing away. Well, there was. I think a I was reading a. Uh, a night Frank report, I think it was, or maybe it was a, it's kind of showing that in a suburb where there are premium properties that are on the ocean front or harbour front or river front or whatever, you know, front it is, but, you know, the performance of them versus, you know, a street back and this sort of disconnect where, you know, the ones right on the front have performed much better, obviously, because of scarcity and livability, et cetera. But it's, it's quite funny when you think about the longer term impact of that where, it could reverse, you know, the person a little bit further up the cliff, um, you know, gets all the returns and the one at the front, you know, is losing its yard day by day. Yeah. Or, well, or you could just, uh, sea, yeah. Rise, sea levels rising by up to a metre in sort of by 2060, so. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's it. You could you could actually go for beachfront at various times in the future. So, you, you know, you buy three streets back <laughs> and you're going for 2050 beachfront. <laughs> A bit like you in your kitchen, Warren, you know? Yes. You, you I'm get not doing it today. Day. Tomorrow they're going to get there one day. Oh, my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, dear. Thank you so much, Warren. It's a very interesting conversation and um, and I do love the fact we sort of skirted around some some pretty good Dumbos, oh, sorry, ed- elephants and Dumbos in there. Um, you know, this is, I think, this is all um, – We've got to understand that we're obviously globalization may be changing, but we're still part of a global economy in many regards. And then we've obviously got all the micro stuff that's happening here as well. And so it's, it's always great when you come along and uh, help us understand what's really going on. <laughs> well, thank you, Veronica, and thanks, Chris. It's been good to have a chat. And uh, yeah, look, we 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 can only try and think about the issues out there because, you know, the thing that we've got to be care- clear on is that the, the world is very complex and the economists can only shed light on the challenges. Um, we've all got to make our own decisions and common sense never goes too much astray. Yes. <laughs> it's funny you say that about economists. I mean, uh, one of the biggest benefits for, to be an economist is no one keeps you accountable, but um, how about we get you on uh, in 12 months' time and uh, have a chat about 2021 because I think it's going to be another interesting year. Okay, I'll I'll do twelve months, and I'll I'll take an option on as soon as Sydney house prices go up ten percent from today, then you got to get me on. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that means Sounds they're like on the forecast, right? Excellent. All yeah. right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Warren. Cheers, mate. We want to make you a better elephant rider, and this week's elephant rider training is... Following up from something that Warren said a few times, actually, was that, you know, really investors typically drive property markets, and this recent uh, surge of activity we've seen is certainly in the owner-occupier space, and, and uh, you know, Warren's sort of saying, well, that's 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 novel, that's different, and, and um, I think let's break it down a little bit because what I find is very interesting is that yes, investors might get into the market. They might, you know, bring more dollars into it. Let's face it, more people, more competition, but the people that get most emotional about property are the owner occupiers. And so if you find that, you know, at an auction and there's a bunch of investors and an owner occupier or two, typically the owner occupier is more likely to prevail because they're the ones more emotionally invested in buying that property. So whilst investors help push the price up, sure they do, it's still the owner occupier appeal that's so important when you're looking at at choosing an asset to buy. I 100% agree. If you want the owner occupier appeal of what you're purchasing, um, but it's very handy if the investors are buying that as well, right? So you've got first-time buyers, you've got downsizers, and you've got investors in the market um, and that, that, those all three of them wanting your apartment or your house or what you think about buying, it's really good for sort of pushing prices up when you've only just got the owner occupier market. So I think that's what, you know, you'll find that when you've got this boom is you've got a lot of investors are buying those, say, low 1 million houses off those first, first home buyers. And, mm. um, that'll be pretty, pretty scary if that happens next year. Yes, hopefully not. But also, I think you got to remember when investors, you know, push property markets, is they're also buying a lot of investor stock, and that's when spookers go yeah, rampant. And exactly. hopefully, they'll leave the first-time buyers alone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Join us for our next episode. We've got Eliza Owen from Core Logic joining us, and she's going to answer a very important question for us, which is why hasn't the Australian property market crashed when everybody thought it was going to at the beginning of COVID? If you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs, or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey and most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. If you're a first home buyer and you don't want to miss a step with this most important purchase, join me on Wednesday nights at 7.30pm Sydney time on the Home Buyer Academy Facebook page for live Q&A. Check out the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. Every month, my team hosts a webinar on what we are seeing at the banks, the best rates, changing policy and their service. We also share the latest insights we hear and read that are impacting the property market direction. Check out wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.